Humans have left their mark on their environment in the form of painted images, works of fine art, murals, and spray can graffiti. To put bluntly, wall paintings are some of the oldest and most important cultural expressions in understanding societies in the urban sphere. Perhaps what draws most of the attention to these artworks are their use of color and pigmentation, catching the attention of pedestrians, drivers, and viewers passing by. Yet over time, the deterioration of mural paintings under the impact of physical, chemical, and environmental factors has caused these artworks to degrade. In an attempt to salvage the art that has flowed into the modern age, researchers, chemists, and scholars alike have sought to identify the best way to preserve public art so that it stays intact. Therefore, this presentation will focus on a material history of colors in the public space. I will trace the development of pigments from prehistoric paintings to murals and other art forms that have gradually been exposed to weather, showcasing how the development in pigmentation has led to permanent contemporary forms of art, like graffiti. I will then touch upon the reason of why pigmentation is an important component of public art, and conclude by describing the different forms of technology that have been able to sustain the art regardless of weather and external conditions, so that audiences may be able to view these works for centuries. First, we need to rewind 30,000 years, where the earliest forms of paintings were hidden in caves. Despite the time period, prehistoric artworks have remained firmly intact, and this can be primarily attributed to the placement of the paintings far back from weather access, in which the darkness of the caves prevented the colors and pigments to be washed and worn down. In this time period, there were three main categories of colors present in the artwork. Yellow ochre, red ochre, and black, also deemed earth pigments. Yellow and red ochre were made by crushing rock, while black was formed by burning animal fat and collecting charcoal from fires, collectively using tree sap, egg yolk, and animal fat as natural binding agents. In this time period, there wasn't any heavy technological or chemical adaptation to the pigments in order to leave their permanence on the rock, since their natural substances contained binding materials. For example, red ochre was known as a color with excellent permanence, which is why red can be primarily seen in prehistoric artwork. The transition then from natural colors of 30,000 years ago to modern age paint was gradually formed by mixing pigments with different forms of binding. While egg yolk was the primary agent in making colors to stick to walls, the 16th century saw innovation for the color white, which was introduced and made from a mixture of lead strips, vinegar, and animal manure. The physical structure of white lead and its reaction with heated oil from the manure produced a flexible, quick-drying, and permanent paint film, marking the beginning of oil as a binding agent in oil painting. The reason for this revolutionary texture was in order for artists to preserve their paintings for longer and see longevity in their artwork. Keeping paintings and murals at an indoor setting naturally kept the artwork unscathed. But what about outdoor works? Where was the transition from natural binding agents to paint that was able to sustain hard weather climates? Which technology was used to formulate a higher permanence in color and pigmentation? For that, we need to look into the creation of synthetic-based paint. The introduction of synthetic paint allowed for artists to exercise their practice in the public sphere, creating murals and concrete objects like stone and brick. The first chemically synthesized pigment was made in Germany in 1704 by Dierbach, who used two binding elements when mixing his pigments, potash and alkali. The scientific or technological binding of these elements allowed the color to fade in daylight and then regain its color in darkness, much like the oxidation process on a car paint or the Statue of Liberty, thereby changing the pigmentation of the color altogether. This marked the beginning of using different binding agents for two reasons. One, to discover new colors, and two, to increase the color strength and longevity. Suddenly, naturally based pigments were mixed with technology of binding agents to create longer lasting paint. Artists today use a mixture of those modern synthetic organic pigments, which have high permanence and intensity, mixed with natural organic pigments and inorganic pigments, which collectively have stood the test of time. In a technological study conducted by Marta Crescenzo, paint brands Le Francais et Bourgeois, Liquitex, and Merimer were chosen as representatives of the three typologies of synthetic resins most commonly used in contemporary mural paintings. To measure the longevity, they used the technology of calorimetrics, which is the method of determining the concentration of a chemical element or a chemical compound in a solution with the aid of a color regent." End quote. In fact, all the colors of the painting which had faded after 20 years of environmental exposure, appeared more brighter and saturated after their conservation in certain outdoor murals. 
Their study conducted that acrylic-based paint was the most successful in retaining color, longevity being water and UV resistant opposed to vinyl-based paints. Therefore, there are specific binding agents used to make colors and pigments last longer for outdoor murals and artistry. With these bindings, paint is able to last longer on its own. But what about the external weathering factors at play? In contrast to the art hidden in caves, outdoor murals have been and are continuously being exposed to weathering, perhaps the most detrimental aspect to color and pigmentation. In most cases, relatively little attention was given to the long-term stability of such public artworks at the time of their creation, because artists didn't take enough care of the properties of their materials. They used low-quality projects that were not made to last in outdoor environments. So, under aggressive weathering conditions, color alteration occurred. These conditions varied from high humidity content, temperature, light, and atmospheric pollution among the main parameters that strongly influence the decay of mural paintings today. After a few decades of being exposed to harsh weathering conditions, murals started to show evidence of degradation, such as severe breakdown of binders, cracks, chalking, and discoloration of the paint layers. In contrast, there are artists who are looking to preserve the microorganisms, such as the Art Laboratory of Berlin, who look to grow fungi and rather turn it into art. They look to preserve the microorganisms. However, preserving colors and pigments is important to keep the art intact. In color and pigmentation, it is rather important to reduce the growth of fungi and microorganisms. In a study conducted on the microbiological degradation of lead-containing pigments in mural paintings, Julia and Natalie seek to investigate why deterioration in the color had occurred in Church of St. John, the Divine, and Rastau, the Great Yaroslav region. An important finding of all these investigations have been the establishment of a relationship between the deterioration of a mural and the development of microorganisms. A painting technique was found to increase the bacteria, known as frescos, a method of painting water-based pigments on freshly applied plaster, usually on wall surfaces. Evidently, bacteria developing on frescos are capable of directly attacking the pigments and the paintings in some sort of way. Through a chemical and technological assessment, their work shows that figmentaneous fungi, yeast, and bacteria have the capacity to degrade and or induce chromatic alterations on yellow and red and ultramarine blue pigments, widely used in mural paintings and traditional lime wash, which seems to be related to some aesthetic damages that affects these artworks. After concluding that oxidation of lead-containing pigments resulted in serious deterioration and distortion of color, the primary agent for preserving these works went into acrylics. As mentioned before, acrylics were favored because of their ability to dry quickly opposed to absorbing moisture. And this topic of drying quickly thus brings us into the final development of graffiti and its imprint in the material history of color and pigmentation. In Origin of Spray Paint, written by Hilary Greenbaum, she writes on Ed Sycamore, an American who makes paint in an aerosol can with a spray head. To quote Greenbaum, she writes that the invention of spray paint for artists was revolutionary. It came in small, easy to conceal, easy to steal cans. It was paint and a brush in one. It dried quickly and it worked well on building materials and subway cars." End quote. Artists were now able to take their paints with them and wherever they went, knowing that the paint would be water, UV resistant, and perhaps most importantly, permanent. This medium allowed artists to paint on any given material, stone, brick, etc., knowing that it would be art to last for a lifetime and not develop unwanted bacteria. The reason this form of spray paint is so revolutionary is perhaps because of the way in which color, art, and pigmentation have been influencing culture and society. To quote J.R. Burnett, the desire to leave a mark on the world for future generations is a strong part of human egotism which has driven the quest for pigments with permanence and intensity of color. The preservation of art and artwork in the public sphere has, however, not just been important for local artists, but because these artworks have contributed on a cultural and societal scale. There have been entire cultural and artistic movements flooding the urban landscape with paint that either brings color to a dull surface or communicates cultural and political messages. 
These artworks are not only there to bring color, but rather create tangible pieces of cultural significance by contributing aesthetic, historic, and social value. These artworks are all tied to the composition and structure of the urban environment, shaping the life cycles of the city. Its permanence and longevity on the landscape proves that the material study of color will keep growing, driving research in a continuous market for new, everlasting pigments. In conclusion, it is easy to view how important it is to keep the art and color as prevalent in the urban space as possible. Tracing back the binding solutions from the prehistoric era is detrimental to understanding how artists have been able to preserve their artwork amongst weather and microorganisms threatening the pieces. And thus scholars, viewers, and passerbyers of graffiti are able to see the transition from using materials that risk deterioration to materials that preserve the artwork and which will make the artwork last for centuries to come. As famously quoted by artist Helen Frankenthaler, every canvas is a journey all on its own. And whether that be inside of caves, to famous murals, or contemporary works, each art form features its own story of materiality, which is why the methods of preserving the color and pigmentation in these artworks has become and will forever be a worldwide phenomenon.